And so, with no little sense of relief, we reach the penultimate game of the season, where we travel to Salford, where our hosts will be Manchester United. Kick-off this Wednesday will be at 6pm, so those of you who, like me, reside in a rest home for the bewildered, may wish to ask Matron to delay the dispensing of the usual soporific pharmaceuticals. Maybe see how it's going at half-time. Manchester United, then. Well, lockdown has been quite kind to them. In the 11 matches that immediately preceded the hiatus, they'd lost four and drawn two. Since the restart, they'd unbeaten. It was a slightly uncertain return to action as a late Fernandez spot kick was required to pick up a point against Minnow's Tottenham. But since then, they've scored a plenty, seeing off Sheffield United 3-0, as ever subject to appeal, Brighton 3-0, Bournemouth 5-2, Villa 3-0 and Palace 2-0. The slight blip on the horizon was the two-all draw at home to Southampton the other night. The results they have had have owed a lot to the usual PGMOL dishonesty though. The penalty given them against Villa was disgusting enough for it to be reviewed by VAR and still given beggared belief. As did the Premier League's subsequent statement which may have well read, well they got it wrong but since it's Man United and they needed a hand at half time we'll let it pass. All of which means they currently sit in 5th place with 62 points. This has guaranteed at least a spot in the Thursday night league. They are of course hoping for an upgrade into the so-called Champions League, a position for which they are locked in battle with Leicester, who, in a fixturist quirk, they meet on the last day of the season. That's if anyone's allowed into Leicester, of course. Actually, the tussle is less of a fight to be in the so-called Champions League, and more of a scramble to avoid the horrors of the Thursday night league, in which each club plays a minimum of 30 matches in a process designed to eliminate the contingent from Moldova and Andorra before the knockout stages kick in. Their latest run-out was a rather disastrous FA Cup semi-final against Chelsea, where they went down 3-1 to Chelsea, obviously. Chelsea's second goal represented the 400th error of the kind that David De Gea never makes. Here's hoping for the 401st on Wednesday night then. Apart from seeing them crash out of the FA Cup, the major fallout from the match was the horrible looking injury to Eric Bailly, whose literal tete-a-tete with teammate Harry Maguire left him facing a trip to the local A&E with his neck in a brace. Thankfully all was well apart from a nasty cut. I suspect that the usual concussion protocols will rule him out of contention for Wednesday. Strangely, the only problem arising from the collision for Maguire were a bandaged up cut and the strange delusion that he was somehow worth £80 million. Concussion's an odd thing. Their major signing in the January window was the aforementioned Bruno Fernandes. Daisy, the socially bubbled personal assistant with a beautiful smile, tells me that this was one of those add-on deals. The initial payment to Sporting is said to be 55 million euros, which I believe was about 47 million pounds at the time. The chaps at Thomas Cook still don't seem to be answering their phones, so I can't tell you. A further 27 million euros, about 21 million pounds, is payable in unspecified add-ons, and Sporting are also in for 10% of any profit that may arise even when the player is actually sold. Although very much a Portuguese international, Fernandes actually started his early senior career in Italy, moving from Bayer Vista to Novara, who ply their trade in Serie B, in the land of Pasta. He moved up a Serie after one season, joining Udinese, with whom he stayed for three whole seasons. He then joined Sampdoria. One season there was enough to convince Sporting to bring the player home and a further couple of seasons in the Primeira Liga, which is Portuguese for the Premier League, saw him gain regular so-called Champions League experience. Something that resulted in the Salford mob putting their hands in their pockets in January. He's been on target five times since the restart and he's not exactly been shy of the assists either. The Paul Pogba saga continues to trundle on in a soap opera style It's been a bit of a drama, dating right back to the player's first spell in Salford, when only a lack of paperwork between the player and Le Havre, which is French for the harbour, saved Manchester United from punishment for illegally poaching the player. In fact, Le Havre were in the process of appealing that decision, but as is the way in the North West, they were given enough hush money and a confidential settlement for all their nasty disciplinary action to simply go away. Pogba's whereabouts for next season may be in question. Last summer, a bid of £28 million plus James, which is Spanish for James, Rodriguez from Real Madrid, was given shrift of the none-too-tall variety. During the intervening months and weeks, barely a day has gone by without some rumour or other resurfacing. Just get on with it for Pete's sake. Elsewhere, 
Dr. Marcus, not Daniel, Rashford gained plaudits for his work in ensuring that free school meals are provided to qualifying kids during the holidays. This, of course, is not the first time that persons connected with the club have been involved in the provision of school meals, though in the past their motives were somewhat less altruistic. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, the club were owned by the Edwards family, who were butchers by trade. They had the lucrative contracts to supply local authorities in the Manchester area with all the meat that went into school dinners. A World in Action documentary uncovered evidence of bribes being paid to council officers in return for the school contracts. These deals were made all the more lucrative by the dumping of all the stuff marked unfit for human consumption on the unsuspecting toddlers of Greater Manchester. Rather inconveniently, Lewis Edwards, the man for all the shenanigans, passed away before the local plod and what was then called the Inland Revenue could complete their investigations. And the FA, as usual, leapt at the opportunity to shut down their own, well you can hardly call it an investigation, despite the evidence of secret bank accounts being used to make illegal payments to players and transfer targets. Thankfully, Rashford action has been spurred on by nothing more than the possession of a social conscience, which, though by no means as rare amongst professional footballers as the papers might like you to think, is still fairly refreshing to see. And so let's move on to our regular look at the wild and wacky world of association football. First we head up to Norwich. Now it's already been a season to forget, and a week to forget, as our 4-0 thumping of them sent them one level closer to it, which... However, just when they thought things had gone rock bottom, they get two set off against Burnley in a 2-0 defeat that was sealed by an own goal. Archaeologists in search of hitherto undiscovered Native American burial grounds could do worse than have a gander underneath Carrow Road, I would suggest. Meanwhile, Norwich will be replaced for a season by Leeds, who will be promoted as champions. You'd have thought Sky Sports might have said something about it instead of glossing over it with their mere 55 minutes per hour coverage of thick Yorkshiremen getting drunk in celebration. And just when you think things couldn't get any wackier, I was got greeted by the news. Fresh on the heels of Friday night's defeat at the Olympic, Watford have now sacked Nigel Pearson. That's right, they've dispensed with his services with two games to go. The announcement seems to have come right in the middle of the Bournemouth vs Southampton match, which would have had some bearing on the club's future, wouldn't you have said? I can almost hear the announcement now. We'd like to thank Mr Pearson for his efforts, but we wanted to give the new chap the maximum time possible to prepare for Tuesday's visit of Manchester City. And so to us. Firstly, I'd like to add my own personal word of congratulations to Mark Noble on the occasion of his 500th appearance for the club. Over the many, many years I've been going to watch us, there have been better, more naturally gifted players turn out for us, perhaps. However, I can guarantee you that not one player in that period has come anywhere near having the passion for the club that Mr Noble has. You get the impression that if someone came up to him post-match and asked him for his fiver subs, he wouldn't bat an eyelid before sticking his hand in his pocket. I have two favourite moments. His goal against Bolton in the so-called Great Escape season was one of the most underrated goals we've ever scored. Go and have a look at it and tell me why it doesn't get spoken of in the same hushed tones as some very lustrous strikes. However, the quintessential Mark Noble, for me, came off the pitch after one of the many occasions in which we'd beaten Spurs. He got grabbed by Sky. Now, players are trained to play a straight bat when the media come a-calling, but for a split second, the player's guard dropped, and the supporter shone through as you saw the biggest grin ever beaming from his face. Hats off to that man. Friday's match itself has seen us just about safe, barring some complex set of results elsewhere. The skipper, between grins, suggested that he wasn't over-happy at the performance, suggesting that we'd sat far too deep in the second half. A wee bit harsh there, Skip. Maybe for the first half of the second half. However, in a move that we haven't seen nearly enough of this season, a timely substitution made all the difference. The arrival of Haller changed the shape of the team and meant that Watford had to return to worrying about us, as been the case during the first half, rather than imposing their game on us, which had been the case for the early part of the third quarter as I hope it never becomes known. As well as the captain, there were good performances all over. Our Bonner's man of the match was well deserved, and I will repeat my earlier comments that any failure to exercise the option or obligation we have to sign to check will be unacceptable. Antonio was quieter perhaps than usual, but still weighed in with a goal, and it's always fun to see a keeper nutmegged. I'm not sure what Foster was doing for Rice's goal, but there again, I'm not sure I care. It was a promising run-out for the youngster Johnson. A few misplaced passes early on maybe, but he stuck to his task well and settled down as the match grew old. As I recall, there are rumours that Ngaki has been linked with Watford. That'd be working out well then. On the injury front, it's one in and one out in the Dyer Carroll Memorial Medical Facility. 
Anderson was fit enough to return to the lower tier of the stand behind the dugout, which is where the subs sit these days. His place in the medical facility had been taken by Fredericks, whose late calf injury sorry missed the Watford game. Snodgrass is continuing his recovery, but probably won't be rest. And so to the prediction then. Well, it's always 12 versus 11 up there, isn't it? If I started to list all the times we've been stitched up by the officials, I'd still be here next season. I note that Lampard Jr. mentioned their propensity to indulge in a spot of diving from time to time, ignoring for the moment the irony of a Chelsea manager moaning about diving. If we are to have any chance, we do need the officials to be honest and trustworthy. So basically, we're probably knackered. Manchester United are not infallible. Southampton's point, late though it came, was well earned. However, I fear that the fact that they will be desperate to be playing on Wednesdays rather than Thursdays next season, and the fact that we should by then have little to worry about, will probably tip the scales in their favour. So, I'll be placing the £2.50 that would have gone toward buying a long service award for Nigel Pearson on a 3-1 home win with VAR to be man of the match. Enjoy the game.